We're at the Seattle Antiquarian Book Fair on uh, October 11th, 2009. I'm Taylor Bowie, and I'm sitting here speaking with my old and dear friend Roger Gozdecki, who for many years owned and operated the bookshop in, is it Covina or West Covina? Covina. Covina, yes. California, and who nowadays operates as anthology rare books in Pasadena. Roger, thank you for joining me for this little interview. Thank you, Taylor. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, good. Uh, first of all, let's hear a little bit about your background, uh, your family, where you were born, where you grew up. I am a native Californian, uh, but my father was in the U.S. Air Force, and um, between, in, in 12 years of public schooling through high school, I um, uh, went to 10 different schools, uh, all through California, uh, the Southwest, New Mexico, Texas, and then um, I attended Whittier College. I was going to be a teacher, and um, uh, found after five years of, of uh, my own education that I didn't want to provide for anybody else's. So uh, Plan to learn yourself. Yes. <laughs> Well, was that uh, the point you first became involved with the book trade in some way? Uh, pretty much. Um, when I was uh, 15, in my um, high school literature book, I came across a poem. So, Buffalo Bill's defunct and used to ride a water smooth sugar shout stallion and shoot one, two, three, four, five pigeons, just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is, how do you like your baby boy, Mr. Death? That was E.E. Cummings. And I fell in love with him. And uh, even before I knew what a first edition was, I knew because he was no longer alive that I wanted to own a copy of one of his books that was the way it was when he first published it. This is a book you discovered in a... Uh, did you then go to a second-hand bookstore to find it? or? Uh... Um, I bought Cummings uh, as secondhand copies, but when I was 21 for Christmas in 1979, 22 actually, uh, I gave myself a present, and that was um, a, a copy of The Enormous Room, the first first edition that I ever, ever bought. Do you recall who you bought that from? Absolutely. Uh, Charles Jimenez, who owned the little old bookshop in Whittier. In the late 70s, Whittier was a great I remember. used bookshop town. There were seven use bookshops within a block or two of one another. Tell us what some of those were. There was uh, the Family Bookshop mm -hmm. on Comstock. There was, the, the most famous one was Harry Ames' shop on Greenleaf. Uh, and it was a big rambling building and uh, they had the, the portraits of, of authors that were done by some artist in Vermont that Harry had and for many people, that was the quintessential news bookshop. That, that was lost during the, the William Arrows quake in 87. Who else? Uh, Ron Anderson, Ron and Dot Anderson, who were members of the ABA. Uh, Ron, were they Ron Dot booksellers? Uh, Ron and Dot booksellers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Ron passed away from a heart attack shortly after the William Arrows right. quake. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Um... Rudy Valdez, mm -hmm. uh, who was a bookbinder, retired from um, the uh, Santa, Fe, Santa Fe Springs School District. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that runs the gamut, but, but it was with Chuck, um, who um, was always running a sort of jagged line um, above legal and illegal. <laughs> that, um, I became friends, and he actively sought out books for me. And when he opened up the shop in Covina, I went to work for him part time. What year would then, that have been? That was 1981, mm -hmm. the spring of 1981. Now, were you still in school, or were you out of school? I right? had left school. Yes, altogether. Mm -hmm. All together. Did together. you get a degree in education, or did you just leave, like like I did? I left. Yes, mm -hmm. well, I, I identify <laughs> with that. And I left to work in the book trade too. So. Uh, how long did you work for me? Uh, uh, Chuck, I, or Chuck I, I, I worked for him after about six months he asked me if I would come to work for him full time and manage that shop in Covina. I managed that shop for five years during that time. Uh, I got married. Uh, we had 
the sun, and um, we made Chuck an offer on the shop, and I bought it. What name did he operate the shop under? His shop in Whittier was the Little Old Bookshop. Little Old Bookshop. And so the shop simply in call it was the Bookshop. Now, okay, I always wondered where that name came from. <laughs> and it was something that you inherited. Okay. And, and because I'd inherited I turned it into the bookshop, first class, secondhand books. Right, I remember yeah. an excellent slogan. Yeah. Yeah. Now tell us again, what year was that? Uh, it was, uh, I went to work for him full time. Actually, it would have been 1982 full time. Mm-hmm. And then we purchased it from him uh, in 1986. Continue the same just, kind of operation. Just continue the, the okay. same uh, operation. Well, what was it like entering the book trade on your own at that time? And, uh, did you feel kind of comfortable about the idea of it? Or were you... Well, you know, um, I, had, I had been scouting, and, and Chuck was smart enough to realize that, that the best way to keep me and was to let me scout, and, and, he, and he let me consign books to the shops, and I was making more money through my consignments than he was paying me, uh, but it was a great education, and profitable, uh, for, both profitable for both of us, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. at, at that time, were there other people in the area that you considered, besides the ones you've already mentioned in the Whittier area, other people in the trade who were kind of role models and mentors, anyone else who sort of giving you a boost in those early days? Um, well, Jim Warson from Fullerton would, would patronize the shop. Uh, Ed Thomas from Book mm-hmm. Carnival. Book Carnival, I remember Ed very well. Very and, nice man. Yep. And uh, Bob Dagg, who was working for Maury Neville yes. at the time, came in often. Uh, and um, Bob was always very nice and helpful, and um, he treated you with respect, absolutely, and, which was very important. And, and um, he said, you know, I've got to have Maury come here because you have some really nice books, and, and, and that that meant a lot to me. Yeah, that, that's good. You know, Bob is a Seattle boy. Yes, I understand that, and, and uh, you arranged for him to go to work for Ken Carmiel at, at, at uh, this book fair, wasn't and, it? And uh, eventually, when uh, Jim Pepper left. Uh, employee of uh, Maury Neville and Bob took his place with mm. the little urge from me. So mm-hmm. I think very highly of Bob as, as everybody does in the trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had this open shop in Covina for, for many years. Uh, mm-hmm. It took you a long time in this open shop environment before you decided to apply for membership in the Antiquarian Booksellers Association. Yes. Can you just elaborate on why that was? Two words. Peer review. Okay. Well, I, now, we have the, now we have the two words, and as Paul Harvey said, now we want the rest of the story. You know, I, I think that most booksellers by nature are not joiners. Um, and... You know, the, the first good book I really I ever had was a wonderful copy of Call of the Wild in the Dust Jacket. That's a nice book. When Maury came down to buy it from me in 1984, he wanted a 30% discount on it. I had it priced a thousand dollars. I said, "Well, gee, Maury, um, I'll, I'll give you 25." And he bought it from me. And the following week, I was standing at his booth from about 10 yards away when I watched him sell that book for $4,000. No, that, that would give, uh, give one pause. Uh. And, and, but, but I said, I should be doing this. Yes. But it took me another 10 years to join the ABAA because I just couldn't get over that hump of having my peers in the trade sit in judgment on. Um, I know. I, I had the, the same reaction when I was thinking of joining in 1981. So, so I, know, I know how you feel. Uh, how did your business change after you joined the ABA? I think most profoundly in that it brought me into the larger professional community of 
the center. So. But you had, of course, one thing people always mention is the benefit of membership is being able to do book fairs. Had you done other book fairs yes. in the area? Yes, Mostly yes. Mostly in Southern California? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Southern California and Sacramento. Mm -hmm. uh, the first ABA A fair was, was actually was in connection with the iLab Congress uh, which was in Los Angeles, and then the fair was in San Francisco, and that was the fall of uh, 1996. And to do a whole month's uh, worth of business in, in, in three days was just outstanding. It's a revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't yeah. always happen that way, but uh, <laughs> it's nice when it does. So that was the year you joined, was 1996? Uh, yes, it was, was the year I was admitted uh, to membership, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, within just a few years of that, we saw the sneaking tentacles, and I don't mean that necessarily disparagingly, but uh, the increase of the Internet in, in our business. Can you just give me some thoughts and impressions about it? how you uh, either resisted or grabbed a hold of the potential of the Internet, and, and how does it work into your business today? Well, um, I was, I've was i always had good staff people, uh, a long series of them, but, but, but at that time, uh, a man named Chris George was working for me, and uh, a younger man named Brad Johnson, and both of those were part of the generation who had right. you know, first become literate with computers. Right. I remember Chris, too. And I was able to turn all that over to them. Uh, and they... We're on film here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Can we run that back or anything? Just yeah. edit it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is. So. You gotta edit that out, too, please. <laughs> <laughs> Take two, and <laughs> we're rolling. <laughs> There's a spot on his tie. <laughs> Throw out the tape. But okay. um, I was I was pretty much able to leave that to them, and and they took advantage of all the things eBay, and and um, plus, this one of the best hundred thirty five dollars I ever spent was at the um, the uh, Colorado Book Seminar. That was back when Dick Weatherford was mm -hmm. on it. And um, he sold an hour of his consulting time at the auction. That was one of the auction items. And I bought it. And it was Dick who really helped me bring me up to speed. Well, sir, I should add that Dick Weatherford has mentored a lot of people in the trade in one way or another, particularly me. Uh, he and I were business partners for, for several years in the mm -hmm. 90s. And mm -hmm. Dick's a great friend and everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eventually, I didn't. Did you start to do book fairs outside of California then? Um, I have, well, some of the regional fairs, I did fairs in Las Vegas. I did, I did in, in 2000 and um, 2005, I did the New York Book Fair. I sold as much as the fair cost me to do. <laughs> That's not an unfamiliar story, I'm afraid, because there's a lot of us in the trade. Not everyone, fortunately. Uh, as you watched your younger employees who were maybe more internet or techno savvy than you, did you start to see that the, the role of the shop, the open shop, became less important uh, over a period of time? Did you begin to see the, uh, the internet and the mail order and other things start to take over from, say, the future? Absolutely, the yeah. absolutely. And, you know, it was, it was at that same time that we began to notice a decline in foot traffic, and um, what was really going on, of course, was there was a shift, a generational shift, from people who were reading books to people who don't. Also, in Southern California, there was this huge shift in the population uh, from being predominantly white middle class, especially in the San Gabriel Valley where we were, uh, to uh, only 25-30% white middle class, and that that was our local customer base that all moved away. Right. So a combination of a change in demographic and change in technology and everything. Did all of these, I assume, led up to your decision to uh, sell your uh, original shop known as the bookshop? What year did you do that? 2006. 2006. And, and at, at that time, we had moved to the West Los Angeles, our residence, uh, and I was making an 80-mile round trip, six days a week, across Los Angeles County. It would take me anywhere from 45 minutes to three hours. 
and um, uh, I just couldn't do it anymore. The overhead was too high. The business was foundering. I had to do something different, and I was looking at closing the shop. Uh, and what happened instead? Brad Johnson, my best customer. <laughs> and your longtime uh, And my longtime employee. Brad had actually moved, uh, moved on. He was working in... Uh, with a uh, political consulting firm. He got involved in the Kerry Pick campaign in 2004. I didn't know that. And discovered that he had a real flair for it. Well, so, a little editorializing, good for him. <laughs> and and it, was, it was an education for him. Uh, oh. I saw him grow no, tremendously. I, I had no idea. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. But he was working with me, uh, helping me at the Santa Monica Book Fair, and I was telling him that I was going to be closing the store in October. Yeah. And he talked to his partner, Jen Zabriskie, and came back to me and said, how would you like to sell it to me? And so that's what... Wonderful case of mentoring in the trade. Yes. Which I wish there was more of. Yes, and yes. That, that is great. I'm very fortunate that it worked out that way. So you turned uh, the, the operation of the bookshop, and the ownership of the bookshop, over to him, and mm-hmm. then you immediately... Uh, reincarnated as anthology, as anthology rare books. Yes. And tell us about that operation. Well, I left the shop after 26 years with 250 books for sale. Yes. Uh, I have about 400 now, but but that's a perfectly good number, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> I, under, I understand. Let's leave it to the younger people who want huge inventories. Because the whole object is to make more money and sell fewer books. Exactly. Fewer and. Uh, Books that sell more quickly, too, mm-hmm. rather than, yeah. than the old days where we waited for people to come in and find right. them. Right. And, uh, right. Now we have so many different ways for people to find them. So, yes. Uh, you're still doing book fairs, obviously. Yes. Here, here you mm-hmm. are in Seattle. Here I am in Seattle as yeah. an exhibitor for the first time. Just We just have a few minutes, but what one does one book or one purchase or one incident in your time in the book trade stand out as being just... You know, one of the happiest things that, that ever happened. Is there some great sale or great discovery or something you're, you remember very fondly? Um, two things come to mind. The, the first story I could tell quickly was um, for I once got a call from uh, the Goodwill Central Processing Center in Los Angeles. And they wanted me to come in uh, once or twice a week and purchase the books that they could not use for their put out for their stores. I could go through them, pick out what I wanted, and uh, for $6 a box, and that was a U-Haul, 1.5 cubic books, I could take away whatever I wanted. We would get books by the garbage bin full to sort through. Among those, once, was a tor- tortilla flat, the Grosset and Dunlap edition. Cracked hinge, no jacket, But it contained what Stanford University has told me is the longest inscription that John Steinbeck ever put in a book. And that went into the box along with everything else for six bucks a box. (laughs) My oh my. Well that that is a that is a lovely a lovely discovery. Would would you say that uh, things are going under this new incarnation kind of the way you you wanted? I mean not maybe as um, in the generally the right direction. G- generally in the right direction. Um, it's 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 really hard sometimes to stay focused on on the essentials. But on the other hand, you have so much time to um, to learn about the books you want to learn about, um, and uh, that aspect of it is just wonderful. Easier for one-on-one contact with. with Customers too, I, I assume. Uh, again, the the disadvantage yes. of the shop is all the distractions. Yes. And, uh, Although one thing I will say about the internet, it's extremely difficult to convert the internet buyer to a regular customer, yes. even if you specialize in things that they collect. I've noticed that as well. I, I, I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps. We need to consult with our younger. Uh, I think colleagues. they prefer the anonymity of it. I do too. I think that's part of it. And and I also think they want to go on the internet and see what's available at that time at the best price, and that's the way they buy. Do you get email messages as I do these days that 
are serious questions about books, but they'll just be signed with a person's first name or not even signed at all. I, I find that yes, really yes, th- that happens. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. a very interesting thing that I don't mm-hmm. think any of the other people I've spoken with have touched on is the the attraction for some people of the anonymity yes, of yes. dealing on the internet. And and God knows at the same time those people who are doing that they probably have these Facebook pages and five thousand friends and but you know, it's, it's a different thing. Who are some of the people in the book trade today that you think? Well, if, if I were going to name a bookseller that I would most like to be when I grow up, yes, that's a good way to look at it. that would be Bill Roos. I think Bill is outstanding, and he is someone that I am genuinely in awe of. Um, he has transcended the trade. A few months, last spring, I got a, a, a brochure from the Library of America. I, I look at it. Board of Directors, Bill Reese. I mean, he, he, he knew he wanted to be a bookseller. He trained for it. He has become a scholar, the authority in the field. He may very well be the most important bookseller of, of his generation. But you hit on something, the scholarship, which, uh, let's face it, not all booksellers have any much a degree of scholarship. Or care about it. Or care, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the bill covers the whole thing. Yep. Absolutely right. Yep. Uh, you're known in the trade for many things. One of them being a predilection to wear suspenders. Would, would you mind just opening your jacket so we can see the uh, pink suspenders? Pink suspenders, yes. They're very attractive. Mm-hmm. Now, can you tell us why, why do you wear pink suspenders? Why does a fireman wear red suspenders? Oh. Old, oldest suspender joke there is. And why does a chicken cross the road? I to hold that. his pants up. Hold his pants up. But I tell you, I wore belts for 30 years, and not once did anybody ever come up and say, geez, that's a great looking belt. Great looking belt. belt, yeah. You wear a pair of suspenders, and people comment on them all the time. They're chick magnets. And, and at an auction, when somebody says, when the auctioneer says, Sold to the short, fat man wearing the penguin suspenders. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> it's, a, it's a form of uh, form of identification. I, yeah. I like that. Well, yeah. you, you wear them well, as they say. Uh, any final thoughts about uh, about yourself, about the book trade in general? Where do you think it's going? Are we in good shape for the future? I think that that answer is unknown. But but I think. Also, that I mean, in all this talk about the death of the book, books will survive, but they will survive in the way that ballet has survived. They will survive in the way that opera has survived. That is, it will still be appreciated. They will still be appreciated by a small group of people, but they will be increasingly irrelevant to the vast majority. Well, the nice thing about our end of the trade is we've always been dealing with a very small number of people anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one thing that I'm curious about, I don't think I've asked anyone else this question directly. We usually talk about the positive things. What do you think, what's wrong, if anything, with the rare book business today? I think that what's wrong is that we are all so focused on being rare book dealers that we've lost sight of being in the rare book collector business. And that is we need to do more to educate and to nurture book collecting. Do you have any ideas about that? I think we need to do more scholarship. I think when we catalog books, we need to talk more about them and tell why they are significant, uh, why they are worth collecting. And I think we need to do more to put books in the hands of people, to, to expose them to them, to take advantage of opportunities through talks at libraries or, or at new bookstores uh, about rare books. Because I think when people see these things, whatever they are, they will resonate with them. So the decline of the retail bookshop, that's one of the things that's added the problem of people not being able to handle them. So, sure. therefore, the, the role of the book fair uh, will continue to, to maybe even expand, do you think? Uh, well, book fairs face economic challenges of their own. Absolutely. Uh, 
but the role of the book fair is very important. And, and I wish book fair promoters would do more to use the book fair as an occasion yes. to host special programs exactly. uh, uh, centering around the book and, and around educating collectors. I think we're um, going to see more of that in the, in the future. Uh, programs tying it in with some other uh, civic civic event or something of that nature. I, I, I'm on the committee for the Los Angeles Book Fair. This is the second uh, fair that I've been on the committee for. And, and we're trying to do that. And it surprises me that in New York, of course, partly because it's, it's Sandy Smith's fair, right. that they do nothing at all for that. No, the, those who aren't prepared to change are, are not going to be around all that long. Mm. Good. I, I don't know. I, I can't say anything else. I don't want to just curious when we like added that thing on is that going to be at the end or can you like put it back in I can put it back okay good alright well let me just see if there's anything else uh, let's just run by how did we get started we did that I already figured out life's changed you don't have to drive so much <laughs> uh, best customer the Steinbeck book story is great Took you so long, pink suspenders, grow up, what's wrong? Quotes <laughs> Family education, getting into the trade, early memories, tutors, internet. Oh, okay, I have one here. One one left. Okay. So we have like a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay, just just kick me or something when we're getting close. Okay. We're rolling. Uh, <laughs> if some bright-eyed young person wanted to enter the book trade today, as uh, mm -hmm. you and I did years ago, mm -hmm. would you have advice for them, uh, either encouragement or discouragement? or What would you tell someone wanting to enter the book trade today? I would tell them to get as much exposure to... The, the spectrum of books, of collectible books, as, as they can. Uh, I would also tell them to take advantage of whatever opportunities, opportunities they have, like through Rare Book School in Virginia or now California Rare Book School, to learn this specialized knowledge because it will just become more and more arcane as less and less, fewer and fewer people know it. So, you and I both started in kind of the same fashion by working for an established bookseller, mm -hmm. um, in my case, several of them, mm -hmm. and there are fewer opportunities like that. That's so right, you're, that's you're, right. You're right. But on the other hand, the barriers to entrance in the trade are now non-existent. You just buy a few books at auction and catalog them yeah. well and put them up on the internet, and yeah. you're a bookseller. You throw together a logo mm -hmm. and a web page yep. in about a half hour. And yep. a, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. but, but just... Do th there is a practice to the trade? There's a right way to do things and 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 not and uh, learn the right way. Uh, learn that you don't make repairs to a book and don't disclose them. Learn that a book needs to be collated and needs to be complete, or it needs to be noted, or it needs to be noted. Yeah. Learn the difference in grades of condition and what that really, how that translate pra translates practically into the condition of a book. And don't ever say a book's in good condition for its age. Yeah. <laughs> say that about your fellow booksellers, <laughs> but not about the books. So there is there is a future. And yes, you, yes, yes, and yeah, you absolutely. And you intend to be part of it. I, th they're going to have to drag me out with my end papers. No plans to retire. <laughs> no plans to retire. Glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. It's been fun. We'll Thank you, you Taylor. It's uh, been great to talk to you.